So today, uh, we're going to talk about the first peoples of the Caribbean. You've probably heard some of the other lectures that have talked about piracy and about some of the, the first peoples. I'm going to go back before Columbus's voyage, back be before his exploration. We're going to talk about the people who came first to these islands. Most of us who have traveled the Caribbean are familiar with the Afro-Caribbean culture. It's what's prevalent today. But what we'll talk about is that culture that preceded that. So we'll start with talking about human migration and when these people arrived and where they came from. But first, I want to give you a little bit of a background about myself. My name is Patrick Goodness. That is my real last name, believe it or not. And my hope is that you're going to find these lectures quite interesting. But regardless of how interesting you think I am, I want you to take the time, if you get a chance during this trip, to meet my, the, my date on this cruise, which is my father, 92-year-old Bill Goodness, sitting in the front row here. Dad is a, a World War II veteran, and uh, I've got a couple of stories. Dad could give you stories for hours and never repeat himself. Uh, so it's a joy. We, he's, I live in Costa Rica. Uh, for uh, almost all of the year, and my father comes down uh, during the winter months from Wisconsin and spends about five or six months a year with us. And one month a year, he comes with me on one of these great cruises. We spend almost a full month together traveling on cruises. We've been doing this for, for quite a few years now. Uh, so if you get a chance to see my dad, he's almost always planted in the exact same seat in the atrium area, very near the piano. So there's no shortage of opportunity to see him there and to say hello. I left home when I was 14 years old, studied to be a Catholic priest for many years. So with a name like Goodness, it seemed like it was in the cards for me, right? It was a wonderful period. I left for the France, studied with the Franciscans for four years. Then I studied with the Jesuits for another four years. And then I went to the South Pacific and did my dissertational work on ancient indigenous mythologies. Let's say that three times fast, right? And I studied with the Aborigines of Australia, with the Maoris of New Zealand, and with the natives of Fiji. And I studied across Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. That was many years ago. And since then, I've developed, through my studies in cultural anthropology and global religions and cultures, some ideas about where faith comes from, about where the idea of religion comes from, and how we can learn so much about our current faiths today, whether you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, uh, if you're Mormon, whatever your faith might be, that all of these faiths of today have their roots in the myths of the past. And so if there's one thing that I can hope that we can accomplish throughout my five lectures, is for us to rethink the idea of myth. Many of us focus on this idea of myth and we think, it's a fable or a fairy tale, right? I would like us to focus on one thing, and it's a very simple request. If you could eliminate any preconceptions that you have of the word myth, and think of the word myth, for the context of my lectures, as a sacred tale, a sacred story. And to put it on the same level as we would talk about our Hebrew scriptures or Christian scriptures or the Book of Mormon or whatever that book that you believe in might be, to think about these stories that we'll talk about today and to think about these people on the same level. And so as we start today, we'll talk about the people of Caribbean, and in future lectures, we'll talk about the peoples of, of the Amazon rainforest, we'll talk about uh, the Amazon tribes, the uncontacted tribes, and we'll walk you through some of their belief systems and mythologies. And so keep that in mind, the idea that a myth is a sacred story. And let's get started. We'll talk about pre-Columbian cultures of the Caribbean. The Amerindians of the Caribbean area grew out of the tropical rainforest culture. So we're talking about, when we think about the human migration, the path of human migration, it starts in Africa. So let's think 200,000 years ago. Out of Africa, humankind became and they stayed in Africa for about 100,000 years. And at that 100,000 year mark, they started to leave Africa, and they, went to, they started to go across Europe, they went into the Middle East, 
to Asia. Some of them stayed in Europe. But they traveled across, went across the Bering Strait, came into North America, and then made their way south. Some of them went much later years up to the corners of Canada, the Thule people, as we would call them Eskimos, but the native peoples, the first peoples of Canada. And then the rest of them made this journey south, the native tribes of the United States of America into Mexico, where we have the Aztecs, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Maya, all the way down to the Incas. And so when they reached this part of the world, South America, about 10 to 11,000 years ago, they made their home there. In this area of Venezuela, Guiana, Suriname, and French Guiana, they had a beautiful home. It was their, their tribal cultures but they weren't completely satisfied. There's always something in us as human beings that wants to explore, to see something new. And for many reasons, they continued their travel. So we can see here that the very first peoples of the Caribbean actually came through South America. The first peoples were two groups called the Arawakans and the Caribs, the Cariban. The Arawakan tribe dominated the Caribbean. They were settled communities. They had well-developed economies, well-developed cultures. But the caravan group, because of their nomadic lifestyle, wasn't ever able to quite be accomplished in the same way that the Arawak were. The Taino, which were an Arawak subgroup, these were the people that first met Christopher Columbus when he arrived. And they were virtually wiped out within just a couple of decades after the arrival of the Spanish because they had absolutely no immunity to the old world diseases. The Arawak today are actually still alive, but not in the Caribbean. The Arawak tribe still survives in present-day South America. There's a tribe of about 15,000 of these modern Arawak in Guyana, where they represent about one-third of the native population there. And you can find smaller groups of the Arawak population in Suriname, French Guiana, and Venezuela. But as you can see, this is a very Amazon, Amazonian-looking tribe. These are very native tribes. So it's, it doesn't jive with what most of us think of as Caribbean native cultures. And this is what I'd like you to picture today, is when we're talking about these native cultures of the Caribbean, to remove the idea of the Afro-Caribbean from your mind, because that didn't happen until slavery came to the Caribbean islands. These are the people that I'd like you to think about, and when you imagine, these are the people, the first peoples of the Caribbean. Their language was also called Arawak. Today, it's still spoken in those tribes, but it's only spoken by the elder adults. So consequently, we know that within one or two generations now, these languages will be all but gone. The Antillian Arawak, or the Taino, were agriculturists. They lived in villages, some with as many as 3,000 inhabitants. They recognized social rank and gave, gave deference to theocratic chiefs. These are points that we make because when you recognize social rank, it speaks to a social hierarchy. It speaks to civilization and culture. So from an anthropological perspective, it helps us understand that they were civilized people. These were not necessarily tribes that were disorganized or unorganized in any respect. And they have theocratic chiefs, which means that very similar to our religions, modern day religions, what they recognize is that the power of man came from the power of God. And so these chiefs received their power from God. They received their right to rule from their God. And consequently, what the chief said was not just what the chief said, but it was the word of God, right? Any of this sounding familiar already? So religious belief centered on a hierarchy of nature, spirits, and ancestors, paralleling the hierarchy of chiefs. They had a very complex social organization, and they were not interested in warfare. This is interesting because it also speaks to a civilized nature of these cultures, that they weren't interested in battling each other. They had come to peace with their life. They had enough to eat. They had their population in check. And so they weren't interested in being a tribe of fighters or warriors. The South American Arawak, so we're still talking about these people in Venezuela and Suriname, uh, inhabited the northern and western areas of the Amazon basin. They were farmers, they hunted and fished, uh, but obviously most of these people had to be involved in some level of air agriculture because there simply isn't enough uh, fish uh, for, hu for hunting and fishing to satisfy the tribes. But they had little hierarchical organization. 
The Arawak were found as far west as the Andes, but they remained isolated from Andean civilizations. So now we can see here that Trinidad, being closest to the, main, to the mainland, separated just by seven or eight miles at its closest point, was the first point of entry for these tribes to come into the Caribbean. And we'll see later on that some of these tribes came from south from Florida into the Bahamas. And then we'll talk about why did they leave? If they had everything great in their current tribes, why would they leave? Well, there's generally three reasons that tribes decide to go off. Number one is war. They're either being pushed or they want to go and to, to discover more land to have more property. But it's generally because of war that they leave. The second one is for simply the joy of exploration, to see what lies beyond. And the third is for any of the men in here, they go off searching for women. There isn't enough women, there isn't enough resources in their current tribe, and so they think that it might be better elsewhere. So they're going to go off, and they have in their minds these dreams of finding these other islands that are populated, as their tales have told them their heaven will be, will be populated with beautiful women. And so the tribal chieftains who want to continue to expand their kingdom tell these young sailors and warriors that if they go out, that they will be rewarded and that they can have any of these women that they find on the islands. Well, when you're talking to men who are in their 20s, that's a wonderful story to be able to tell them, to get them to go out and to travel and to, to, to see these islands. Historical records show that the Amerindian peoples have existed in Trinidad for as many as 6,000 years before the arrival of Columbus, and for at least... 40,000 of them at the time of Columbus's arrival uh, and the Spanish arrival in 1592. This slide is what you think it is. It's cannibalism. Uh, it's a slide that we'll talk a little bit more later in, in some more detail. But Trinidad was populated by several tribes as a transit point in the Caribbean, and it was a network of Amerindian trade and exchange. So Trinidad was this point, this focal point, where all of trade came from South America and from the Caribbean. So the groups from the Caribbean would come to Trinidad, and then the groups from South America would meet in Trinidad. And this was a focal point for trade within the Caribbean, the Southern Caribbean. Leadership. Now we'll talk a little bit about the organization of these tribes. The chief is a position usually inherited or elected depending on circumstances. So if this was a wise tree, chief, a kind chief, a deliberate chief, thoughtful chief, who died on good terms within his tribe. He possessed a spiritual manna that upon his death would pass to his son. And so if he was a good chief, that spiritual manna would pass to his son, and his son then would assume the chief status. If, however, he was a nasty chief, he was not well respected, when he passed, it is also assumed that his spiritual manna would pass to his son, and consequently they would not allow his son to be chief. They would then hold an election for a new chief to start a new lineage for their chiefdom. So a very interesting concept here uh, based on whether or not the chief was a proven chief, a peaceful chief, and a kind chief. The semi-chichi is the medicine man. These are children that are generally taught from very young, the ways of the forest, that taught the ways of, of finding curative healing properties, but also to commune with the animism of their faith. And we'll talk a little bit more about animism, but they saw life in all things. And so the semi-chichi was meant to be the priest, this divinator of all things holy, all things sacred, to help people recognize the sacred and to ingest and to bring that sacred into their lives. The war chief was elected based on his skills for the position. Obviously, he wanted a fierce warrior. And so these tribes were very democratic. They would elect their chiefs. Elderly females, a keeper of traditions. This position, again, is inherited or elected. If a woman lives many years and is able to pass that wisdom on to her daughter, her daughter then becomes the, elderly, the chief elderly female in the village upon the passing of her mother, and she grows into that role. But if she didn't fulfill that role properly, then a new woman is elected for that position. The council, this looks like the monkey see, monkey do here, right? The see no evil, hear no evil. 
Two or three elders in the community would be consulted from time to time, but this gives you an idea that this wasn't a social structure that was willy-nilly. This was a social structure that was very well founded on the ideals of democracy, that they believed that every person had a right, every person had a say and an opinion to be respected. And you'll see this across these ancient tribes. Amerindians were nature worshipers. And when we speak about nature worshipers, I'd like us to think about this in the context of these are effectively Stone Age people who have not developed a theology that extends beyond nature. And that, as of most Amerindian tribes, most native tribes, their focus is on animism. Animism comes from the Latin word anima for breath or spirit or life. And it's a religious belief that there is a spirit, there's a spark in all things. And it's not just in human beings, but it's humans, animals, plants, rocks, the winds, the sky, weather, even man-made objects, because in order to have spirit, you must have purpose. And if man creates an object with a purpose, that object is then imbued with the spirit of the man. So animism is used in the anthropology of religion as a term for a belief system for many indigenous peoples. It is in contrast to what we see today and to most of our very well-developed religions. So we'll talk about that in a future lecture about the fall, for those of you who are Judeo-Christian background, the fall from grace and the Bible story and how here what we see is a, com a communing with grace, a communing with nature itself as the foundation of their religion. Although each culture has its own different mythologies, animism is probably the most common of all of the ancient tribes. The animistic perspective is so widely held that they don't even have a word for it. This was just their belief. So if you were a native tribe person, you believed that spirit was in all things, that the spark of divinity, the spark of God of life was in all things. And so consequently, to live in that place, you needed to respect every single thing that lived, whether it was a rock or a tree or the wind or the water. It was living amongst that because to exterminate or to use poorly or to kill anything in nature was to lead to your own destruction. So animism is a foundational understanding of our place in the world. The currently accepted a definition of animism was de developed by Edward Tyler, and he said that it was really anthropology's first concept, that the idea that when, we were when all cultures developed this concept that God is nature and nature is God. And so consequently, think about these people in their daily life. They were ruled by the waters. They were ruled by the sun, by the moon, by the stars. These were the things that gave them life. These were the things that they understood. And so consequently, they imbued these with the same spirit that they believed themselves to have. And why wouldn't they? Animism encompasses all the beliefs that all natural phenomena, all material phenomena, have spirit and purpose. So mountains, rivers, all of these things have a spirit. They believed in the great spirit as the God that they cannot see. They also believe in the gods that came, became manifest through nature. And in this respect, they were polytheists. Today, many cultural anthropologists see a great similarity between these ancient faiths that had the one god and many sub-gods, very similar to Catholics who worship one god, but also have the litany of the saints, the saints that are responsible for many things. So, for example, if you grew up in the Catholic faith, you have St. Jude for lost causes, St. Christopher for traveling, St. Francis, the patron saint of animals. These are saints that we look to for guidance, we look to for inspiration, and that also in the Catholic faith, we pray to them for intercession, to pray on our behalf to God. And it was very similar that these theists believed the same thing. They believed in their one spirit God, but that there were many other lesser gods as well. The Arawak and Taino believed in gods of nature called Zemi. They were unlike the gods of Greek, the Greek gods, but they were also similar to them in many respects. They didn't have the individual personalities of the Greek gods, but they had similar 
at respect the, the similarities to Haitian voodoo, the Loa, and also the Greek gods, and that they believed that they were both good and bad. The idea of an all-good God, an all-benevolent God, is a relatively recent construct in religion. For most of our religious histories from the dawn of time, we understood that there was both good and bad in the universe, and consequently, we saw our gods in the same way. Our gods were a reflection of how we saw the world, so we would see both a good God and a bad God. There was that duality. Or if there was a singular God, that that God was both good and bad. Like the Greeks, they believed they were good and bad, reflecting the world that they lived in. They were highly ritualistic. They had rituals for almost every practice, from eating to planting to hunting. Because they saw the divine in everything, there was a ritual to appease the divinity in each of these things. And now I'm going to ask you to put on your current religious caps, whatever your current religious affiliation might be, and see if there's any similarities to what I'm going to speak about now. So during their rituals, they chanted and danced and played their musical instruments. They also smoked tobacco, incense of sorts, right, to create sacred smoke, and they wore special clothing, headpieces, garments, and they did face and body painting. At religious agricultural feasts, people induced vomiting with a stick. And this was an idea to purge themselves and to show their dedication to improvement. So already we've talked about the costuming, right? How they dress differently for these rituals. And now we're talking about a ceremonial purging. A ceremonial purging that we might think about in the Christian or Catholic faith would be confession. It's a purging of your sins. All those things that, that make you... Um, soiled within. And again, this is, goes back to the Judeo-Christian idea too that it was Jesus who said, it's not what you eat that makes you sinful, that makes you evil. It's the actions that you have. But the, the Jewish perspective was the idea that you didn't eat certain things. And that came from far back through the Sumerian tribes, that it's what you ate that made you evil or that made you sick or ill uh, or vile. And so consequently here, there was this rite of purging and even when we die, we have that same act of purging for us who believe in the idea of purgatory, that before we can go on to the next part of our life, to eternal life, it's the purging of all of those things that are sinful in our lives. And so in this ceremony, they did this ceremonial purging to demonstrate their commitment to improvement. After the purging then, the women served bread, first to the gods, and then to the chief, and then to the other people. And this sacred bread was a powerful protector. So are we seeing now the, the similarities and the comparisons to the Holy Communion? Now keep in mind that this was happening at almost the exact time that Judaism and Christianity was being developed on the other side of the world. And so the idea here is that there are principles, there are concepts, Carl Jung would call them archetypes that are in the back of our minds that's this thread that connects all of humanity to each other. And so that these stories and these ideas are present not just in the faith that we hold today, but they're present in almost every single ancient faith. And so the similarities are very interesting. And for those of you who believe in God, this is another representation, an opportunity for God to reveal himself. But for those of you who don't, this is an interesting social construct that then follows anthropo anthropological lines through this thread that binds all of humanity together, that there's a similarity of thought that connects all humankind. And then finally, in the end, there was singing and there was reading of great stories. So this very same, this, this similar ceremony is very similar to the liturgies that we have today where we read the sacred stories, the sacred texts, we sing the sacred songs, we share bread, we do the confession beforehand to be worthy of this ritual. These are all very interesting similarities to our current day religions. In the afterlife, Good was rewarded with a heaven, if you will. The death would meet other relatives and would find its peace. Interestingly, there was a significant emphasis on meeting women in paradise. It was like the ultimate dating. It was said that paradise was filled with beautiful women. So one could infer one of the following, right? Either that most beautiful women were also good and thus deserving of their spot in paradise, 
or that men were ridiculously bad and they had to be tempted with this idea of women in paradise in order to get them to behave. I think we're all very well aware that it's probably much more likely to be number two. Many Arawak and Taino stories account for the origins of natural events. So when we think about myths, there's four purposes for myths. And the myth takes on one of these four roles. We have the mystical role of myth. And the mystical role of myth is to help connect us to the awe of the universe. These incredible things to help us understand why these things happen. And then we have the cosmological to help us understand our place in this universe. And then we have the sociological, which helps us define our roles and how we should fit in and how we should live our life. And then the ped pedagogical, which helps us understand our position from birth to death and exactly our role and our function inside of it. So it's those four roles that are critical, the critical roles of myth. And so I'm going to talk with you about some of these myths that the first peoples of the Caribbean believed in. So the first myth is about how night was created. And the idea is that they would borrow the night from these creatures. And so the first creature that they borrowed, and let's think about this as Goldilocks and the Three Bears, if you will, as well, okay? So this follows the same kind of a format. The first one that they met with was the mouse. But the mouse, because he was so tiny, his night was so short. So they barely had any time to even have a smoke around the fire. And before you knew it, they'd finished their smoke. The sun was coming up. Well, they couldn't possibly use the mouse this night. So then they went to the tapir's night. Well, the tapir slept way too long. And so consequently, by the time that they woke up from the tapir's nap, days had passed and their huts had already been grown over with all kinds of vegetation. People had come in and stolen their things. So they couldn't possibly borrow from the tapir's night. And so what did they do? They borrowed from the night of the armadillo. And the armadillo's night was, as you could imagine, just right. And when they borrowed the night from the armadillo, they switched places with the armadillo. And now the armadillo doesn't have his night anymore. So consequently, the armadillo is awake all night while the rest of us sleep, and then scourge is, uh, it does all of his... his um, gathering by nighttime, and so he sleeps during the day. So he switched places with us, allowing us to be able to have that wonderful sleep at night. And this is how they explained their sleep, and also how they explained why, of course, the armadillo foraged at night. So deprived of night, the armadillo sleeps during the daytime. Now we'll talk a little bit about the creation story. And interestingly enough, you're going to see in almost every major ancient tale a snake in the creation story. We like to think that the snake is a unique concept for the Hebrew scriptures, but it really isn't. It goes way back uh, before these modern-day scriptures, as we would call them, to these ancient tales. So this story is a man who warned his sister not to bathe in the water, not to bathe in the pond, during the times when she was unwell. And ladies, we know what that time is. For a long time, she obeyed his instructions but after a while, she said, you know what, I'm not going to listen to my brother. I'm going to go to the pond and to bathe. And she went in the water, and she was caught by a large snake, and she became pregnant. The woman would leave in the morning and would always come back with large baskets of fruit. And the brother was wondering how this was possible since these big, beautiful pieces of fruit were... Let me see here, I've lost my screen. Since the big baskets of fruit could only be gathered if she climbed the tree, and she couldn't possibly climb the tree. So he followed her and saw that the snake was now transforming into a man at the top of the tree and was shaking this fruit and giving it to her. The next day, the snake coiled around the tree again and changed into human form and shook this, the fruit from the tree. But as the snake was about to reach the ground, the brother chopped up the snake and killed it. And so the woman gathered the snake's pieces, and from those snake pieces grew out the Carib tribe. So what we see here is that the snake was a form of God. It was an earth god. And that the Carib people then were the descendants of this earth god. So again, it helps them explain their position in the world. 
that this tribe was descended of this wonderful snake, earth god. We didn't see the snake. They didn't see the snake in the same way as original sin or as a, 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 a cause that led people to, to sin. It was simply a part of nature. And now we'll talk about the tale when love was first made. In the jungle, the first woman and man looked at each other and they said, what do you have there? And, and the man said, did they cut yours off? And she said, no, I've always been like this. And he examined her up close and he scratched his head. And he said, you know, you should probably rest for a while here. Let's just lay in the hammock and I'm going to go out and I'm going to gather you some, some lotions and things. I'm going to take care of you. But in the meantime, don't eat any of the fruits that split because that's obviously going to make your condition even worse. And she obeyed. She patiently swallowed all the herb teas and let him rub on all the lotions. But she was getting tired of sitting in this hammock for too long. So one evening, the man came running through and he said, I've got it. I saw these two monkeys. And the monkey, male monkey, had just cured the female monkey. And so he said, that's how it's done. And when the story is told that when the long embrace ended, the dense aroma of flowers and fruit filled the air. So how beautiful. They had rubbed themselves in fruits, and when it was all said and done, the aroma of fruits and flowers filled the air. And that's when man first made love. And now, all of you have been wondering, right? Where did mosquitoes come from? I told you there would be something worthwhile for you. I'm going to tell you exactly where it happens now. It's the idea that there was a young boy in these villages, and this young boy was a bloodsucker. He was like a modern, he was an ancient day vampire. And this young boy would go from village to village and he would kill people and suck their blood. Well, they had to do something, but no matter what they threatened with this boy, he was unafraid. So all of the taunting, no matter what they did, they couldn't hurt him. And so he suggested that if they were going to kill him, that they burn him. And when they burnt him, all of his ashes went up into the air and the ashes filled the sky and became the first mosquitoes. And so it's the ashes of that first boy who now suck your blood around the fire. And that's how mosquitoes were created, just in case you didn't know. They also talked about the dangers that happen. So the man who made the sun and the moon. So think about this now. These are these ancient cultures saying there was something that was an uncaused cause. We have all of these parts of nature, right? We have the sun and the moon and the stars. But they said, where did this come from? And they said, from our understanding, there must be a man who has created this. And so the man who created the sun and the moon warned the Tainos to watch out for the dead because he said that the dead in daytime hide themselves and eat guavas, but at night they're out there haunting the living. And dead women seduce living men. So before a man should lay down with a woman, the first thing he needs to do is to feel her belly button because the undead don't have belly buttons. So that was the way that they did their test to make sure that they were not being, <laughs> weren't, being weren't succumbing to, the, to a, uh, a dead woman at night. The Lord of the sky also warned the Tainos to watch out even more for people with clothes on. So now think about these stories. This is before the people arrived, and they had a story that they understood about people with clothes on. Now, we would look back at this and say that's probably not, tr not true, that this story probably came later after the people came and was a creation to tell them that these were people who were going to be bad and help them understand and be connected to their ancient faith. But this is where it's really interesting. Brief shall be the enjoyment of life, announced the invisible one. He who has a mother but no beginning. How many Christians do we have in the group? Fair number? Who else has a mother but no beginning? Right? This is the uncaused cause. This is Jesus from the Holy Trinity, that he has a mother. He has an earthly mother, but he has no beginning because he was from all time the beginning. And so consequently, this understanding in one line is an intense understanding of a deeply theological concept. And they understood it in the context of a single line. He who has a mother but no beginning. And this man, this God, announced, the invisible one announced, men wearing clothes shall come, dominate, and kill. So now there was no man who delivered this message, 
but it was the invisible one. So again, we have the idea of the burning bush, this voice from the mountaintop, but this is the voice from the jungle who now says, be warned that men wearing clothes shall come, dominate, and kill. And now we'll talk about the arrival of Columbus. He gets all the credit, of course, right? Everything is defined by pre-Columbian. But the idea is that before he arrived, all of these islands were known as Guanahani by the native Arawak tribes. And these were the Taino people. These were the first people to greet Columbus when he came to the islands. Now, mind you that the Taino were grouped in large communities. They were in Cuba. They were in Jamaica. They were in Puerto Rico. All of these islands that today have very little semblance and and remembrance of these ancient tribes, but these groups were there well before Columbus' arrival. The Taino were the first people to greet Columbus, and then they were also there in uh, the first settlement of the Americas. Now we'll talk about cannibals. This is where I get all these great questions about, did cannibals actually exist in the Caribbean? And I'm not in any position to say yes or no, but I'm going to tell you some stories and let you make the decision yourself. So Christopher Columbus, to his great embarrassment, missed his destination by just a mere 8,000 miles, right? He was expecting to be at the Indies. He was expecting go, to go to the Grand Khan, a golden city that was said to have existed on the other side, on the eastern coast of China. But he was obviously misguided by a full 8,000 miles. And so he created a myth to help explain where he had landed and to help people understand what they could do. And I'll I'll guide you through to the end of this to see why he said what he said. The word cannibal is actually derived from the mid-16th century Spanish word for the people of the Carib tribe. So we say Carib, but the Spanish would have said Carib, right? Carib, Caribbean. The word cannibal, plural, cannibales, was written by Columbus to describe the Caribs. And so we can see this connection here, the Caribes, Canibales, Canibes, Carib, and the cannibal. So it's an easy, when people are writing things down and it's being sent back and forth, it's very easy to make these misconnections. But the really interesting thing is what Columbus said about these people. He said, and he wanted to create this idea of duality, that a great story has to have an antagonist and a protagonist, right? Right? So we have to have the good versus the bad. We have to have these two tribes where one is battling the other and good wins. Well, he didn't see that in the Caribbean islands. He saw just peaceful tribes for the most part getting along, but they were caught up in their own lifestyles as well and and the way that they lived their lives. And so he talked about the duality and it made for a very strong story. But Columbus observed the wounds of the people who had come to see him. And he thought that these people must be being attacked by these cannibal tribes. And so based on his understanding of Greek and Roman mythology, Columbus described these people as mythical beings with snouts of dogs who ate men. Right? And so what does that do? It makes these people who eat men less than human. And what does that set us up to do when someone is less than human? It allows us to turn them into slaves. If we were to see these people as equals to us, as equal people seeking peace, seeking their own way of life, it becomes very difficult for us to go back and say that we should enslave these people. But when we equate them with dogs and with Greek tragedy creatures who have snouts of dogs and who eat men, we make them vilified. And we make it very easy for us then to do nasty and vile things to them. So how did Columbus miss the mark on this? Well, what Columbus really observed was the marks from hostile relations between tribes. These were trading tribes. They would trade in between one another. And let's say that you were trying to build a relationship and you came with maybe offering your daughter as a sign to join your tribes together. And in return, a man gave you a basket of fruit that anyone can gather that would be an insult to that tribal chief who was offering his daughter. And so consequently, that might be met with a blow until he decided to increase his offer to equal the value of his daughter. And so this was a common occurrence that they would strike each other as a means of identifying and stating that your, your, your gift back was simply insufficient. 
And so not understanding these cultures, he understood it through his own perception of those cultures, and he missed the mark. So consequently, he didn't understand the indigenous language. He didn't understand their cultural traits. And his conclusions were based on the fact that he believed that he had been reaching the islands of the Grand Khan on the other side of China. So the decision to call these people cannibals was primarily a driving force for their enslavement. That when he was able to qualify them as subhuman, they became then easy prey for enslavement. Europeans were fascinated by the notion of cannibals, but sadly there's absolutely no evidence that these ancestors of modern Caribs were actually cannibals. Now, I will say that there is a great chance that what they could have also witnessed was ceremonial cannibalism. And we'll talk about this when we get into the, uh, the tribes of the Amazon. And ceremonial cannibalism comes in two different ways, where it's endocannibalism or exocannibalism. Endocannibalism is when you eat people from your own tribe, but you do it for, spir for spiritual purposes. So when someone dies, that person has spiritual energy and grace. And so we would eat, we would ingest that person in small bites to receive some of their spiritual grace. And in the same way, the reason that they would eat that person is because they believed that that person's body was now something other than human, but that the piece that they were eating was, imbi was imbued with the spirit, and that by eating that person, that person became alive again in their bodies. And so consequently, the only way that we can stay alive is by eating living things. And so they understood this, that if they ate someone from their tribe, they ate a small piece of them, and they would all share in a piece of that person's spiritual power. And then the other part of it is exocannibalism, where they would kill people who simply wandered into their territory and were killed because they shouldn't have been there, and because they didn't recognize other people from other tribes as possessing that spirit or that power, they were able to eat them without any problem whatsoever. It was just another meal to them and a good kill. So that could have possibly passed down to these tribes, but we can't say one way or another. It's likely that they could have passed some of that because their heritage from Amazonian cultures says that that's what was practiced, but we're not sure if those practices continued all the way through the Taino and the Arawak people in the Caribbean. Oh, looks like we're having a bit of a spaz here now. There we go. Okay, Spanish settlement. With the, with the discovery of gold deposits on the island, Hispaniola started to grow substantially. Disease and conflict started to kill out these people. And soon, it wasn't long at all. By 1504, the Spanish had overthrown the last of the Taino chieftains on Hispaniola and had established their supremacy on the islands. In the next decade, the Spanish committed a brutal atrocity, the genocide of most of these people. And so everything that we know about these people was largely wiped out at that time. The population of Hispaniola at the first point of European contact was said that there might have been over a million Arawaks, a million Caribs living in these islands. But by 1514, it had dropped to 35,000. So imagine, even if we take a look at a, a reasonable number of, say, half a million, going from half a million to a mere 35,000. And if we think about the large number of over a million down to 35,000, that's a tremendous massacre of these people. By 1509, the Spanish had successfully conquered Puerto Rico and had subjugated approximately 30,000 Taino. By 1530, literally less than 25 years later, there was only 1,100 Taino left on these islands. Interestingly, Taino influence still survives today. It doesn't survive throughout the Caribbean, but it does survive in some of the places where we're going to be going. In French Guiana and Suriname and Venezuela, there are still some of these tribes there for example, the Locono tribes and other South American groups resisted in a similar way to the Andes, uh, the people of the Andes, the Incas, that they resisted the Spanish colonization by hiding up in the hills and the mountains. These people went deep into the rainforest and the jungles and were able to resist the Spanish influence. And they eluded them through the 16th century. In the early 17th century, these same people then aligned with Spain against the English and the Dutch and the neighboring tribes. 
And so they continued to benefit from these trade arrangements all the way through the 19th century. They went, they declined, and now they're back up on an incline again. These populations and their cultures are discovering a renaissance. So all of these native cultures now are coming back and the governments are supporting them and supporting efforts to maintain their languages and their cultures. Interestingly, the, the Spaniards who first arrived in these islands, they didn't bring their wives. Well, if you're gone for a couple of years without your wives, you're going to be very glad to see the native women when, they, when you arrive. And so consequently, why, while Taino culture, Arawak culture, has largely been decimated as a culture, the bloodline still continues to live on. In fact, a, a DNA study in 2003 determined that 62% of people in Puerto Rico have direct line maternal ancestry to Taino ancestors. So that's remarkable, even though, and of course we can't really see these lines through the Afro-Caribbean cultures. It's much more difficult to see this in, say, a Jamaica or a, even in Haiti. But when we take a look at a much more purely uh, traditional Hispanic culture of Puerto Rico, where there wasn't the influence with the Afro culture as much as in the other cultures, we're able to see that 62% of these people still have the direct descending lines from the Taino era, uh, ancestors. So I'm going to close with an absolutely awful joke. But you can't do a lecture about cannibalism and not end with a joke, right? So there were two cannibals uh, who were sitting around the fireplace. He invited one of them for dinner. And, and the, the one friend said, you know what? I really hate my mother-in-law. And the other cannibal said, don't worry about it. Just eat the vegetables. <laughs> and thank you. All right, thanks very much for coming, folks. It was great seeing you.